Your generous support makes this ministry possible. Thank you. Obviously, what is this starting to get into? What areas are we asking with this little survey? Family or childhood? Family. We need to turn to a couple passages with me. First to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Um, this goes beyond the realization, obviously, that it's in God's plan, His desire for families to have children. I. I don't want to get my conviction is that a family is not defined by children by the way I believe when a husband and wife are married that is a family all right before God a husband and wife is a family they are not defined as a family by having children they're enhanced as a family by having children all right nevertheless it is I believe part of God's desire and hope and it is normative for a husband and wife to have children not gonna happen for everyone and that doesn't condemn them or speak less of them, but it is still nevertheless normative for the majority of you to get married and for the majority of you to have children. As example, what he says to, to uh, Noah in, in Genesis chapter 9, be fruitful and multiply. It's a, it's a definite part of the family structure to procreate and to have children. That's a good thing. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, he goes on to talk a little bit more about this family unit and, and some of the expectations that God has. Starting at verse 1 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I commanded you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, and when you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Help me out here with this passage. What are some of the expectations that families are to have in response to God and to children, parents, I mean, the whole issue there? What are some of the realities that should be there? Family is the primary way in which God's law is transferred. With God having certain norms of life and how to have a relationship with him god desires the family to be one of the main ways in which it's communicated right what else are you see seeing from that passage that you receive blessing from, uh, from okay. that by doing what god calls you through that blessings Name some of the blessings that are mentioned in that passage. Long life. Long life. Anything else? Increase, everything will go well with you and you increase greatly. <coughs> multiply. Be fruitful and multiply is not talking about bananas and uh, multiplication tables, is it? Right? Very clearly, it's a continuation of your family. Through the, through the intimacy of a husband and wife having children. That's a blessing from God, right? What other realities are you observing from this passage? I'm supposed to put up reminders around. How many? Everywhere. Everywhere. I mean, 
I mean, he goes in to talk about when you sit, when you stand, on your foreheads, on your arms. I mean, Jews use those phylacteries. If you've ever seen them, they, they wrap a box right to their forehead, and they'll put it around their arms and things like that as a means of trying to remember the, the law of God, and they'll put it on the frontals of their doors. And I mean, essentially, no matter where and what you are doing, you as a family are commanded, given the opportunity by God, to disseminate His truth with the hopes and joys of the blessings that come. Now, I do note that, you know, just last week, when I was at that conference, I will say it was encouraging. One of the main speakers was uh, Dr. Piper, John Piper, and he, um, he's a very gracious man. Uh, he, he's very open and honest almost all the time, almost uncomfortably so at times. You're like, are you supposed to be saying this to 7,000 people at one time? I mean, you, you kind of wonder, but he's very open and honest about his struggles. One of the things he, he kind of went on talking about some of the struggles that he has, one of which, and he, he worded it so well, he says, I am a man who loves to enjoy the praises in the multitude, but struggles to lead devotions in my living room. I thought that would be a profound truth because I'm right there myself. I love getting together in a church or in the auditorium and with holy hands lifted up praising my Lord, but in my own household with my wife and my children, I'll be honest with you, it's a struggle to follow through with the daily commitments of what God has called us to do. And that struggle is what God realizes that all families will deal with. It's not easy, but it's still something we need to, with joy, pursue. All that to say, who, who are some of the people that are mentioned in here? Obviously, God's in there, but can you give me some other descriptors, specific people that are mentioned in that passage? Fathers. Fathers. All right, who else? Children. Children. Who else? Grandchildren. In fact, it's very specific, talking about three generations, right? Normatively speaking, that is what most of us experience, the progression of families seen within three generations. Now, obviously, some have more within their families. For instance, my, my, grand, my sons, um, that's that generation, then my wife and I, and then they have their grandparents, Dr. and Mrs. Van Dyne, and my parents. But even beyond that, Mrs. Van Dyne's parents are still alive as well. None of my grandparents are still around, and Dr. Van Dyne still has his mother, but they're here in Dubuque. So my sons not only have their parents, and not only their grandparents, but they have great-grandparents as well, which I think is pretty cool. They're, my my uh, in-laws, they love the boys. I mean, they just, they, the boys love them too, mainly because they get to ride around their scooters all the time and go really fast, and it's, it's pretty fun to see that. Nevertheless, I realize as great as that is, the normative progression for most people is children, parents, grandparents. And understand, within a biblical economy, within a biblical times, how did those three generations interact? I mean, even geographically speaking. They like, either lived closer in the same house. Most of the time, within the same home, right? Under the same roof. My parents from India, I grew up, was born and raised in Canada, so my grandparents were literally across the world. I saw them maybe, you know, once every four or five years. I really didn't grow up with my grandparents. Something which I'm so thankful for now that my sons do have their grandparents. I, I think that to be a huge blessing. Nevertheless, it's normative for an individual have, to have the influence, the perspective of, a, of three generations. Sometimes it'll be less, sometimes it'll be more, more, but it's normative for you to have that interaction with your parents and grandparents. Just out of way of curiosity, how many of you is that a reality for, where you have at least some influence and access, let's say, at least to your grandparents? Okay, and so this classroom kind of bears evidence to that. That was not the case for me. I really didn't have a lot of contact with my grandparents. But I think Scripture is trying to get across that that family unit is normatively spoken of within the three generations, all right? So from there, turn to Exodus 34. Because while the Deuteronomy passage gives us the ideal, the Exodus 34 passage gives us the non-ideal, the, the problem, the, the way not to do it. Um, what we want families to do is to take the laws of God and with joy disseminate it between the three generations for the blessings that come. It's Exodus 34, let's start at verse 6 to see the other side of the coin. The Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands 
who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Whew. So help me out here with this. Play this out for me in real life. How does this actually happen? Is it, does this mean that when you sin, your sin will be passed on genetically to your great-grandchildren? Is that what this is saying? Well, like the punishment for the sin is passed on because, well, a lot of sins, they affect your family in mm -hmm. such a way that there are irreversible effects kind of thing. The effects of it, right? Okay. Other, and I agree with you, by the way. I think that's starting on the path. Can you think of examples, actual stories, situations that you might know of that highlight this idea that what the father does and the actions he performs, including the sins, start to have a, what I can call, a trickle-down effect onto successive generations? Yeah. A father who leaves the family you know, during a childhood the way that child grows up and becomes a father himself. Yeah. I'm assuming you've seen that before, right? Can you even think of biblical examples? Or other non-biblical examples. It doesn't have to be biblical examples. The kings of Israel, how they're, you know, it was just spiraling. All the time, right? I mean, they continued in that vicious spiral, but understand a spiral is... By definition, cyclical. Something like that happened before where it's come back full circle. The problem with Israel is that they kept on descending down, right? Understand, one of the things I do not want to say to you here is essentially what Freudian analysis does. Is that by looking at the past of the individual, especially into their childhood and those de developmental stages, because of some type of problem there in Freud's language, some type of maladaptive behavior, some non-progression through stages, ego, defense mechanisms, whatever, because something happened in the past, they are now fated to be in this problem now. Do you understand what he's trying to say there? Because your mother hugged you too much, or because your dad didn't hug you enough, you are now determined to be this messed up. What are your thoughts with that model? Well, I mean, it's not really true because usually, I mean, as far as I know, like, it gets better with each step usually. Like, I have a personal example. Like, my, my grandfather mm -hmm. was, like, kicked out of home and had to work as a 12-year-old on a farm and, like, just had a really rough mm -hmm. life. And he just was kind of, you know, cold to my dad. And sure. So my, my dad had these tendencies of being really bad communicator. Right, right. And he had five girls. Woo. How about in the thick of the storm, yeah. I've seen my dad struggle and grow to change, and he is so amazing. Praise God. He's, he's a believer himself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, uh, go ahead. That's the difference. The... <clears throat> The Holy Spirit working to right. reverse that. Right. And, and that, that there is the biggest reality. And that, so I never deny, and I can say that even to some degree, non believers can experience change apart from the Holy Spirit, but ultimately that change is for naught if it's not done in relation to the Holy God of the universe, right? Well, you can change all you want, this side of glory, but if it's not to the glory of God, then it's for hell. So ultimately, what we're talking about here is that families. And again, normatively speaking, each one of us are going to be in three generations, right? And depending on where you're at, some of you are in the first generation, or you're the grandparent, or some of you are the parent, that's where I'm at, or you're the children. I assume most of you are kind of in this stage of life right now, and one day you'll be a parent, and you'll have kids, and they'll have kids, and then you'll be up there, and you'll be on the top. Yeah, woo -hoo. Understand what these two passages are saying, though. That what you do, all right, has an effect, an effect, not a determination. Please hear the difference between those two words. What you do has an effect, meaning the good that you do, the, 
the obeying of God's laws and the blessings can actually be something that you affect even for the grandchildren that aren't even here yet. That's pretty profound when you think about it, right? That I don't even have grandchildren yet, but the decisions, the attitudes, the, the way that I try to live out God's love and law in my life can be a benefit to them even though they're not in existence. Just pretty amazing. But understand, it can also go the other way. That the sin, the rebellion, the attitudes against a holy God can also have a negative effect on the children and or grandchildren that I may have. That what I do, how I act, can affect. But I do not want to ever assume that it determines. All right. So here's the phrase. You're going to write it down. You're going to memorize it. Feel free to tattoo it on your toes if you need. You are affected by your family, but you are not determined by your family. Did you hear me say it? Because I'm going to do it one more time. You are affected by your family, both for good or bad, as given by the Deuteronomy and the Exodus passage, but you are not determined. Meaning, I can't look at the sins of my father and say, well, of course I have to... Of course I have to lie. My dad lied, so now I have to lie as well. To which I say to the person, baloney! You make your decisions, you made your bed, now lie in it. But I can tell that person, it's understandable why you may want to go that route when you've been affected by someone in your family who lies all the time. But man up to the reality that you're still held responsible for it. Freud, in his psychoanalytical model, really tried to get people into more of a victim model of saying, well, I can't change who I am because of my past. To which I say, uh-uh, I have an example in my life, in Heidi's life, in, he, in everyone's life, that something came in, namely someone came in, and broke that cycle. That God can come into the vicious downward spiral of cyclical problems in a family that struggles with alcoholism or depression or pornography or whatever it is and by the grace of God can break that cycle because you are affected but you're not determined. I was hoping all of us would say it together so I'm going to try one more time. Because you may be affected but you're not determined. determined. You are still held accountable before God. None of us will be able to say to God, I had to sin this way because of my family. God will say, no, that's not how it works. You're responsible for your own sin. But when we're working with people, part of the process that I do believe is very helpful is getting to delve a little bit into their family. Not just to bring it up and to harp on it and to say, oh, woe is me kind of thing, but to help them realize the reality of their family in the past to take hope of what is in their future. Does that make sense? you got to dig up a little of the past, and even some of it's hurt, to get beyond it to find hope in the future. That's what we're really desiring by getting into what's clinically known as family of origin, family of origin issues, or family of origin. F-O-O, -O, which spells... Well, Safu, I know you don't want to say it, but it's okay. We do it all the time. Family of origin is a big branch that is fairly popular within counseling psychology now. It's known by other names as family systems or, or, or family cognitive learning. The idea that we're looking into the past of the family to help a person understand why they may be doing and thinking and acting the ways they are, but to progress beyond it that you're not determined by your family even though you may be affected by your family. That's essentially what I've given you in this uh, family history analysis. Um, Family history analysis, yeah, I got it right. Um, this is a, simply a technique. It's, it's a little tool that you could use to get the conversation started with something. And again, I'll tell you right now, I don't pull this paper out when I work with people. Hello, my name is Ben Matthew, and what is your name? Okay, great. And, and, and tell me about your mother. Okay. I don't do that when I'm working with people, but I do take principles out of this. I do take questions out of this. I kind of make it my own and I get the information I need to help me make a game plan of where I need to go, right? And so that's what this is. These are just kind of techniques. I don't know, maybe that could be a good name for a course. Methods and techniques. Hey, there they are! Woohoo! It's working. The idea that you're trying to find out a little bit about their history. Now, the way another technique that you can do that is known as genograms. 
which I'm sure you've heard of because you have to make one for me, right? Especially um, looking at these different ideas of the generational aspects of you and your family. Again, please realize I'm not going to be sharing this with anyone. I will be seeing it, but I'm not sharing it with the rest of you. My hope and desire, though, is that you yourself go through the process of learning about family of origin, knowing the dynamics within your own life, so as when you work with other people, you maybe appropriate that within their life as well. This is not the end-all, be-all of counseling, but it is a helpful tool, a technique, in trying to bring some help in going through that process of how to bring them hope and some of the answers they need in life. A genogram is just another technique. I often say a genogram is pretty much a family tree. Is, has anyone ever done a family tree before? I had to do one in junior high. My mom is the youngest of 11 kids. My dad's the oldest of five. I have literally over 100 first cousins alone. That's just first cousins. Most people were coming in with their family trees on like, you know, eight and a half by 11. Here's my family tree. I had to do two big poster boards to fit all my family in. I'm like, hey, this is my family, you know. <laughs> um, it took some time. And I don't know if you guys may be there as well, but it's more than just a family tree. It's more than just saying, here are my grandparents, here are my parents, and here's my siblings and everything else. It's also delineating the relationships. And this is the harder part in my estimation. Because you're not just saying that we have a biological link but you're also saying that we have an emotional, sometimes spiritual link as well. For instance, I had a student a couple years ago who did one of these genograms, and one of the indicators that he put is when and where family members got saved. None of his grandparents were saved, none of his uncles and aunts were saved, none of his cousins were saved, but his parents got saved. And he, he kind of indicated it with a little cross to indicate where he got saved. And to start to see the effect, not the determination, I'm not saved genetically, but to start to see the effect of when his parents got saved, then he and his brother got saved, and he's now married, and they're expecting their first child. And I'm thinking, God's grace, I pray, continues, right? He's not determined by it, but he is affected by it, and they broke that cycle of unbelief within their families. Let me show you a couple examples. And on Thursday's class, we're going to spend some time actually doing one of these together, all right? Actually working on it actually based on a passage in Scripture. But here's an example of uh, this family. Does anyone know what family this is, by the way? The Bushes. It's an old picture of the Bushes, but there is a, a George I, or President I, and there's a George W. right there. And Barbara. It's a great name, isn't it? Barbara. And uh, all the other kids. This, this is the uh, Bush family. And here is their genogram. All right? Now, this goes back. Understand, this is... a uh, George um, W. Bush right here, um, he has two daughters, Barbara and Jenna, twin, twin girls. As you look and understand, so it, it looks like a family tree, right? Help me make some observations with this family first. And again, it doesn't have a lot of emotional or spiritual uh, delineations, but it does have some other information in there. Can you make some observations? Lot went to Yale, huh? It's helpful to be in this family if you want to go to an Ivy League school. Um, again, that was something that you might have experienced, but I know certain families demand, almost insist, that their kids go to a certain education, a certain expectation, academically speaking. That was pretty fierce and hard in this family. What else do you observe? Yes. Skull and bones. Skull and bones. Anyone know what that is? You're, you're laughing like you have some idea, brother. It's a, uh Society, and uh, they're part of it. Yeah, it, it, it's actually part of the yell. Uh, think of like like a fraternity, but super exclusive, super secret for the only the top echelon people in society. Um, you have to be invited. You can you can't apply for it, and it's based on Yale's campus. There was a movie that came out a number of years ago called The Skulls with, I um, can't remember the kid's name, he used to be in Dawson's Creek, that TV show, but the idea was based off this, that there's a super elite society that has all these incredible privileges that none of the peons like you and I have access to, but only the, the, the society and powerful elite. 
the idea is that so many of these people will become the business leaders, the political leaders of the future. So if we get them in our organization now, we can thus move and puppet the strings of society and culture and power. Which, when you look at some of the people that were involved in Skull and Bones, did they have some influential people? At least two presidents of the United States of America. Gary was too, wasn't he? I, think, I believe he was, yeah. yeah. And not, I mean, we're talking about like the, the top elite who's who of society that were involved in this kind of organization. And it seemed to be pretty involved with the number of people in the Bush family as well. Other observations? They have like, dyslexic We have one here. Is there another one? I don't know if there's another one there, but. Does that say car up there on the right? Right here? Yeah. Um, I believe so. I'm trying to think. Maybe that's talking about car accident. Yeah. And there's leukemia, like two big things that have to. There's where? Leukemia. Oh, right. Yep. That person died of leukemia. If you look all the way up here as well, I mean, they have ancestors all the way back to other U.S. presidents and other royal families. I mean, this has been a pretty powerful, politically influential family for a number of <laughs> generations. So it's understandable that it kind of continues on, right? When Franklin Pierce was president up here, it's not determined that his ancestry would have two other U.S. presidents in it, but it's somewhat understandable why it was such an important part that this Bush and this Bush would all of a sudden desire and aspire for that office. It's always been part of their family history, right? Let me give you another one here. Kennedy. Kennedys. They got a big family. They're Catholics. So a lot of families, not much more. This is the Catholic, uh, Catholic family, <laughs> the Kennedy family. And uh, now this is a little more convoluted. A lot going on there. But if you can see enough, I'm going to hand these out to you as well. But can you make any observations? Where's Kennedy? Pardon me? Where's Kennedy? Uh, JFK Kennedy is, yeah, John is right, yeah, there he is, sorry, John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Ted Kennedy just passed away recently, if you were watching the news, Senator. There's a lot of crime and drugs. <laughs> a lot of crime and drugs, huh? Yeah, I mean, again, can anyone say, well, I had to do the drugs, I'm a Kennedy. They may try that defense, but it's not going to work, right? But it's somewhat understandable that they struggle with that issue when it's so prevalent within so many other members within their family as well, given the dynamics of that family. Yeah? What is, what, why is Rosemary Fuller halfway? Rosemary, um, I believe, if I'm remembering my, is, that was a... There's some guys up at the top too. Now I need to look back into that. I don't remember offhand. If that means either one that she was died early, or if it was a stillbirth, or something along those lines. I need to look back at my symbols. But it doesn't have a death date. It just yeah. has a... Yeah. I need to look back at that. Which, why, it could have been a stillbirth, because death date and birth date, birth date and death date were the same. My first thought is that's a stillbirth. Rosemary? John F. Ke Kennedy? Rose. Yeah. Are you seeing the, the connections here? Joseph Sr. here married Rose. That means they're married. And they had all these kids. Last of which here just passed away recently. Are all of them? Yeah, Robert had a lot of kids with Ethel. That's a great name, isn't it? Ethel. Robert and Ethel had a lot of kids. Wow. What's with the, uh, the line that goes from Joseph Sr. to Kathleen? Kathleen. Um, and we're going to talk about all these symbols because I'll be expecting all these in your genograms as well. Lines constitute more the emotional relationship. So while part of this is a biological representation of generation, the lines, like this one, 
indicate usually that there's some type of distance between those two people. Comparatively to two lines between John F. or Money Fritz and Rose means that they had a good relationship. Dotted line means a distant relationship, like um, they weren't really close. They weren't. Th this had some relationship. This had a better relationship. You might even see three lines, which usually means what's known as an enmeshed relationship. Does anyone know what that means? You ever heard the term a mama's boy? Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> it's almost a little too close, right? It's not healthy that he's that close to his mother when he's 32 and she's still making decisions for him, right? Um, this means that there's, there's some, some distance between, and again, who are we talking about here? <coughs> Husband and wife. Yeah, with nine kids. Is that possible? Yes. Very much so. How old is this genogram? Because there's people that are dead that... Uh, it's, it's 2002. Copyright by Monica McGoldbrick. Yeah, so, okay, so why are the ones down towards the end x out at some point, but then the ones up above where obviously they're dead aren't Yeah, the X right here and the lines aren't necessarily meaning they're dead. Okay. Yeah, some may be. In fact, if you look at the Kennedy family, I remember when, um, who was it? John John died in 99. Did you guys hear about his? He, he died in a, in a plane crash. And he, when that happened, there was this belief that the Kennedys were a cursed family. They're kind of the royalty of America, right? And the idea that, oh, look at this person died doing this, and he died in a plane crash, and um, sure, there are other ones here. Well, President got shot. His brother also was assassinated. There was another one that died in a skiing accident. There are ones earlier that died. And so the thought was, oh, they're a curse. When Statistically speaking, you get a family this big, it's going to happen, right? I mean, there's no curse. It's just kind of how it happens. I want to show you one more before we finish. We'll continue this on Thursday. Um, Well-known family and uh, some of the issues that they deal with as well. Um, you can definitely see. I've only done two here, but um, obviously there's some problems between him and his oldest child who perpetually live in the state of a year, seven, and ten years after, what, 20 years now on TV, but nevertheless. Um, Marge, she's definitely an enabler, meaning she doesn't really help out with a lot. She just kind of continues. Maggie has had a pacifier in her mouth, um, for, again, for 20 years. <laughs> has a go. Lisa, very much an overachiever. Middle child syndrome, always feels left out kind of thing. Um, and then Santa's little helper over here on the side. I think this is the second one they have now. I think the first one died, but nevertheless. All that to give you an idea some of the, the relationships between generations.